Hi, welcome back to The Unteachables, Chapter 3, Parker Elias. I love the sound of the pickup truck makes when the motor roars to life. It's even cooler now with that little muffler problem, but that'll only last until Mom and Dad save the money to get it fixed. Even without the extra noise, though, it's still awesome. I look down at the start button. That's what I saw the first time anyways. Now I know that it really says engine, start, and stop. That's what reading is for me. I see all the letters, but they're kind of mismatched. Like my class at school, which is SCS8, although it looks like SS8C or S8SC or even CSAS. It messes me up first a little until I figure out where I have to go. And then it doesn't matter what order the letters and numbers are in. The pickup jaunts is over the packed dirt of the driveway before bumping onto the paved road where our property ends. Our farm is right outside town, so I haven't gone very far when a police car pulls right up beside me. The cop gives me a thorough once-over with his eyes. I'm used to it. I'm kind of small for my age, so I look like I'm a 12-year-old out for a joyride. I thought that new girl's eyes would pop out of her head when I jumbled down from the pickup on the first day of school. Or maybe that's the expression she gives everybody who knocks her book bag halfway to the moon. Let's set the record straight. I'm 14. They don't let you drive any younger than that, no matter what your special situation is. It's okay, though. The policemen around here all know me. The cop rolls down his window and peers into the flatbread of the pickup, taking note of several bushel baskets of fresh tomatoes. You're taking those over to the farmer's market, right, Parker? He calls, right, officer, and straight to school after that? I shake my head. First, I have to pick up Grams. The cop frowns. Grams? My grandmother, I explain, I have to take her to the senior center, senior, senior center, then school. That's why I have a driver's license in eighth grade. It's a provisional license, although to me, it usually looks more like rival Snoopy Iceland's. I'm allowed to drive the pickup so long as it's for a farm business or Graham's, who's pretty old and sometimes kind of confused, no offense. My folks both work crazy hours on the farm, so I'm the only one who's free to pick her up at her apartment and take her to the center where she hangs out all day. Then I drive to school and after school, I pick her up and take her back to our house for dinner. She doesn't live with us though. She refuses to give up her own place, my independence, she calls it. The law says I can do this because running a farm is considered a hardship. That's pretty stupid because we actually prefer living outside the city and having tons of open space when everybody else is stuck on a little post-its stamp of grass. Plus, we don't have livestock, so we don't have to do any of that really gross farm things like sticking your arm up the butt of a sick cow. It's only I've only seen it on TV, but hard pass. I drop off the tomatoes at the market, watching the clock impatiently while Mr. Sardo weighs everything to the millionth of an ounce. Then straight to Graham's. She's waiting for me in the lobby of her apartment building. But she's wearing a winter coat and it's like 80 degrees out. So I have to park and we go upstairs to put away the coat. And by the time I return from the closet, she's in the kitchen, warming up leftover meatloaf for me. But Graham's, I'm going to be late for school. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, kiddo. I used to like it when she called me kiddo, but now I'm pretty sure it's because she can't remember my name. It bums me out. To be fair, she called me kiddo before she forgot my name too. The difference is now that's the only thing she calls me. I already had breakfast, I tell her. You want mashed potatoes with that, she asks. It won't take long. No thanks, this is fine. Obviously, I eat the meatloaf. It's actually pretty good. Graham still can still cook, even though it's she's forgotten most other things. She's been knitting me a sweater for the past three years that she can't seem to finish. I've gotten a lot bigger in that time, but it's okay because so has the sweater. 
It's draped over the back of the couch, a mass of drop stitches, hanging strands and random colors. It looks like a giant psychedelic wool amnibia. I gulp down the food as fast as I can, but it, it, but it still throws off the schedule. By the time I drop grams at the senior set, center, I can already hear the bell ringing at school. With my grandmother, there's always something to slow you down. If it isn't meatloaf, then she's buttoned her blouse wrong, or she's wearing slippers instead of shoes, or she's waiting for Grandpa to come home, even though he's died a long time ago. I used, I'm used to being late. Grams is worth it, but it's my fourth time already, and it's only the first week of school. I barrel around the streets, busting the speed limit by a lot and blowing at least one stop sign. I screech into the school parking lot, leaving a small mark on the side of Mr. Scarcasian's M BMW. Not good. Carefully, I back out and find another spot. This one is on the opposite side of the lot. I pull my trusty can of scratch guard out of the glove compartment and rub the evidence off my front bumper. Then I work on the beamer a little. Not perfect, but it should keep Mr. S from noticing the damage long enough for him to have obviously no idea where it might have come from. This is usually the part where my day starts to go downhill. I love getting to school, the driving and all that, but once I'm here, not so much. There's no problem with the building, and the teachers are okay, I guess. It just happens to be a place where I'm bad at everything, that's considered important. It's a long walk to room 117. I take it slow because who wants to rush to somewhere you hate? I'm already late though, so I open the door and walk inside. Before I know it, my feet slide out from under me and wham, I'm flat on my back on the floor. It gets a big laugh and scattered applause from the six kids who are already there. The only person who doesn't react is our teacher, Mr. Kermit. He never lifts his face from the New York Times crossword puzzle, except occasionally to take a sip from a humongous coffee cup. And that's not just today. He's like that all the time. Yesterday, when Barnstorm chucked one of his crutches and shattered the globe, the teacher didn't so much as flinch, not even when the Horn of Africa bounced off the side of his head. You could probably set off an atomic bomb on his desk, and he wouldn't never notice. I scramble up, but when I turn back to the doorway to see what tripped me, I go down again on my face this time. I could smell the floor and taste it a little. There's butter all over it. Who greased the floor, I howl? The kids laugh louder, enough to penetrate the cone of silence and capture Mr. Kermit's attention. He glances up, sees me flopping like a fish out of water, and quickly goes back to his puzzle. He, if he's not the worst teacher in the world, he's definitely the bottom five. Most embarrassing of all, Kiana has to rescue me. She's the only girl whose backpack I hit with the truck. She hauls me off far enough from the buttered area that I can stand upright again. My shoes are still a little slippery, but at least I can walk to my desk. Kiana turns to the rest of the class. Who did that? Ram, who's fast asleep, lifts his head off the desk and looks around like a deer in headlights. Did what? Let it go, I murmur, red-faced. Why should you, she demands. Somebody buttered the doorway. Mr. Kermit's not going to stand for that. Absent-minded, hmm, comes from the direction of the teacher's desk. Shh. I drag my broken body into my chair. Who's the mystery prankster who almost put me in intensive care? Plenty of possibilities in this class. Barnstorm, the injured sports star, gets away with everything. At least he did until he was put in room in SCS 8. Aldo, the jerk who flies off the handle every time the wind blows. Elaine, a sneak, I sneak a look over my shoulder at the scariest girl in eighth grade. Oh, please, don't let it be her. Elaine rhymes with pain. I'll probably never find out who buttered the floor. If it's Elaine, I don't want to. When I glance up, Mr. Kermit is standing in front of me. At first, I'm flattered that he's come over to make sure 
I don't have a concussion, but no. He places a worksheet on my desk and wordlessly returns to his crossword puzzle. That's what we do in the special self-contained eighth grade class. At the beginning of each period, Mr. Kermit hands, hands us a worksheet. No one does them. At least that's how it was in the beginning. There were a lot of paper airplanes sailing around the room for the first few days. I figured Mr. Kermit would get mad, but he, ne he never made a peep about them. So the airplane stopped. What's the point of making them if you could, couldn't get a rise out of the teacher? Eventually, it got so boring the only possible thing to do was the worksheet. It's kind of hard for me, though, because the letters get all jumbled up. Even if it's math, they never just ask what's 5 plus 3. They have to make it into a story uh, about five brown rabbits and three white rabbits having a rabbit cotillion. That's where I get lost. Cotillion looks like the Sid Loon to me. I'm hundred. I'm excuse me, I'm hunched over my paper, trying to make heads or tails of what seems to be unbreakable to be unbreakable code when at the desk beside me, Kiana sets down her pen and peers at my paper, which is as untouched as the minute I got it. You haven't started yet, she hisses. Sure I have, I replied defensively. She isn't sold. What question are you on? One, I shoot back. I'm taking it slow, okay? I return to work, staring at the letters, w willing them to arrange themselves into a form that makes sense to me. I guess I look like a scientist peering into a microscope because she blurts, you can't read. Yes, I can, I say defensively. I'm just pacing myself. She reaches over and plants a finger on question one. What does that say? There's no talking in the class. I tell her, you want to get us in trouble? Mr. Kermit takes a long, loud slurp of his giant coffee. Read it, she orders, and I don't. It's not that I can't, but it won't, but it would take time. I feel, I don't feel like it, I mumble. Parker, she urges, this is stupid. You can get help with this. You just have to tell the teacher, but nobody can help you if you don't know there's a problem. My eyes find Mr. Kermit. His attention never wavers from his crossword puzzle, even though Ram and Barnstorm are sword fighting with rulers and Aldo leaves the room altogether. If I have to depend on Mr. Kermit for help, I'm going to be older than he is before I get any. We'll read chapter four next. Aldo Brath.